the club with his pants falling down or the dance that's a dream of romance or the scene where the villain is me that's entertainment the lights on the lady in tights or the bride with the hello and welcome to that's entertainment i'm your host jeff decker what I wanted to try and do is show you some great films, entertainment packages, whether it's television, theater, even music at some times. But in this case, it's going to be, I'm highlighting, Basil Rathbone. And the movie tonight is The Hounds of Baskerville. It's a classic. He's been on 80-some different features. And some of you might remember from some of the things he's done that were later on in life that were kind of fun that he did with uh, Boris Karloff. He did some horror movies and that. But what he's outstandingly known for is playing Sherlock Holmes in this whole series of great, great suspense stories. And we're going to see The Hounds of Baskerville. If you haven't seen this, it's going to be a classic that will stay with you forever. Fabulous when it comes to whodunits and Sherlock Holmes is the best at figuring it out. Little history of Basil Rathbone himself. He was a fencing master and I was fortunate enough to study with one of the guys that he worked with. In fact, my uh, fencing master coach, uh, Vladimir Navazinsky, who was my instructor at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in California. Yes, we had to learn fencing. Uh, Vladimir was actually in a few pictures with him because of Basil's experience with fencing and how good he really was. He taught Errol Flynn, Tyrone Power, if you see uh, Sea Hunt and some of the other great movies that had some fabulous fencing scenes in them, Robin Hood and what have you. Basil taught most of them, but along with Vladimir, who was my instructor, Vladimir's known for he was killed eight different times. Eight times by Basil in one picture, Robin Hood. So they dressed him up in different outfits, so he looked like somebody different. Eight never he was known as the man who got killed eight times in one picture. The fencing scenes were fabulous, but Basil is so popular with the Sherlock Holmes features. His acting skills beyond what anybody could imagine. So many fabulous things that he was part of if you get a chance. I'm going to bring you as many of these different series on Basil, part of the Sherlock Holmes series, but stay tuned for a lot more of just pure entertainment. Each and every time I bring on a show, I'm going to try and relate it to it's that six degrees of, of knowledge that they have publicized out there. And so my six degree to get close to Basil was his eight time kill, Vladimir, was my fencing instructor and he worked with Basil on so many different pictures that involved the fencing masters. It's really exciting to know and be close to. But my experiences in Hollywood are now part of your experiences in Hollywood. We've got to get to the picture. This one is a classic, folks. I'll be with you at the very end, but I want you to see and enjoy The Hounds of Baskerville. <laughs> Hello, this is Davis, Stuart Davis here. I'm a writer, the editor of Sherlock magazine, and the author of Starring Sherlock Holmes, which covers the detective's film and media career from 1901 to the present day. During my commentary, I'll interrupt myself to comment on anything particularly important that's happening on the screen at the time. So by the end of my commentary, I hope you'll feel boned up on Sherlock. The Hand of the 
Baskervilles began filming at 20th Century Fox Studios in December 1938. Its first screening was on the 31st of March 1939. Although there have been other versions of Conan Doyle's most famous Sherlock Holmes story, notably a silent version starring Eileen Norwood in 1921 and an early sound version with Robert Rendell in 1931, remarkably, this fox hound was the first production to set the story in its original Victorian setting. As with Hollywood in those days, there was a little location shooting. Whatever was wanted was created on the back lot, and that's what Fox did. They created the moor, as you can see here, and later we'll see the London streets. This is a very mysterious Hello. opening. Nothing Hello, is particularly everybody. explained of who the man is or who the dead body is. It's just to engage the viewer's attention straight away. What a spooky opening, a dead body and a scream. The inquest scene which follows introduces all the main players or main suspects in the story. In particular, Lionel Atwell as Dr Mortimer, an innocent medical practitioner in Conan Doyle's novel, but in this movie is given a pair of sinister spectacles and graced with low camera shots, and therefore he emerges as a very suspicious fellow indeed. To what do you attribute the death of Sir Charles? Heart failure, sir. I might add that for some time Sir Charles was in a highly nervous state, worried. Something was preying on his mind. And did he confide to you what was preying on his mind? Well... No. Well then what about those footprints, Mortimer? Is and we also see Stapleton, played by Morton Lowry. And as a man of science, so I... I, Mr. Stapleton. And we've also right, seen John Carradine as Barryman running, the butler. All red herring characters ready to be suspected by Sherlock Holmes. There are moments Silence in cinema history when there is a magical pairing of actor there, and no, role which leaves an indelible mark in screen history. One thinks of Clark Gable as Rhett Butler, Humphrey Bogart as Rick Blaine in Casablanca, Gloria Swanson as Norma Desmond, Charles Lawton as Quasimodo, and of course, Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes. And we're all waiting for him to appear. There is an apocryphal tale of how Rathbone got the part of Holmes. Allegedly, it all started at a Hollywood party, where the head of Fox, Daryl Zanuck, was in conversation with the director, Gregory Ratter, and screenwriter, Gene Markey. The topic got around to the ideas for new movies. One of the trio observed, someone should do those damn Sherlock Holmes stories. Well, who would you get to play Holmes? Basil Rathbone, of course. It was inspired casting. Rathbone presented the ideal image of Holmes, and we are shortly going to see him. But first, we glimpse Watson as the lean shape of Holmes passes him by. Director this Sidney Lanfield teases us, clippings. not but showing us Holmes straight fun. away. I have an idea, Watson, that young Sir Henry isn't destined for a very long existence in this world. What? My conjecture and is there he is, murdered. the epitome murdered? of the Paget drawings which illustrated Very the original stories in the Strand magazine. Rathbone was tall and lean. Dorothy Parker oh, once Holmes, described him as two profiles pasted together. He, he to carried to himself in a direct guardsman-like bearing uh -huh. with an extraordinary uh, angular face, a long sir. aquiline no, nose and defiant jawline. In these opening scenes, Peveril Marley, the director of photography, emphasizes these features by some wonderful close-ups. Perhaps it was Rathbone's destiny to play Sherlock Holmes, to, to become Sherlock Holmes. In his autobiography, In and Out of Character, Rathbone wrote, Ever since I was a boy and first got acquainted with the great detective, I wanted to be like him. To play such a character means as much to me as ten hamlets. Well, once you've got your Holmes, you need your Watson. Watson, it will be remembered, is the doctor who shares Holmes' lodgings at 221B Baker Street the man who chronicles his cases and assists in I his investigations. 
20th Century Fox really, Watson, chose soldier, Nigel soldier. Bruce for the role. Bruce, who was actually three wrong. years huh? younger than Rathbone, a made a Hollywood career like out of playing upper-class buffoons in practically over 100 movies. Although he was actually born in Mexico and was the son of a Scottish baronet who happened to be visiting that country when his son was born. It is fair to say that Bruce's Watson is far removed from the character conceived by Arthur Conan Doyle. But Watson has always caused a problem for script writers because basically, for most of the time, he's an observer and a describer. Rubbish. On screen, this How would be very dull to present the well, detective's part in, in such a way. He would do and say Dr. little, Watson, so the screenwriter has to give Watson something else to do. Holmes, Either that or marginalise him altogether. Certainly, I this is what happened to all the movie Watsons up to the hound. So <laughs> but in so the case of Nigel Bruce, yes, Fox decided hospital. to do something with him, to make him a blustery comic character, a sort of comedy foil to Holmes. How you do in The Hound, we only glimpse the beginnings of what will become a full-blown pantomime performance in the later Holmes films. A friend of mine is in great so here we get Lionel Atwell again. He and Rathbone were old sparring partners. The same year, they'd appear together in Roland V. Lee's The Son of Frankenstein. Fans of this film will remember the famous darts match. Atwell has a false arm and he sticks his darts in it between throws. Rathbone and Atwell were destined to appear together again in a Holmes movie. Atwell made a fine Professor Moriarty in Sherlock Holmes that was a of the and coroner, the secret in weapon, I, as a child concurred, 1942. It was, one point it was one of the modernised Holmes films that was made at Universal. Yes. About 50 yards from where Sir Charles fell dead were footprints. A man's or a woman's? Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. A hound? Well, why didn't you report it? Not a soul would have believed it. During the night it rained, and in the morning the marks were completely obliterated, but I saw them as clearly as I see you. And then, a few days ago, as one of the executors of the estate, I found this. That particular this exchange, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound, Legend taken exactly hound from Conan Doyle's novel, was at the end Let of the first you, episode Holmes. when the story was originally serialised in the Strand magazine. You, you can imagine yes, please, the chill on. and thrill that the readers must have felt at in that particular moment, rebellion, having to wait a month before they would find out more Baskerville about the story. Was held by Hugo of that We're going to hear more now. Man, We're going to hear the legend of the Hound of the Baskervilles. The retelling of the legend is a, a popular feature of many of the versions of the Hound. Sometimes the producers of the film give the role of Wicked Hugo to the actor playing Stapleton because, in essence, he is a direct villainous descendant. But if the audience is shrewd enough to look beyond the long hair and the beard and the makeup, they can see who the character is and it, it gives the game away. So, Fox cleverly gave the part to Richard Green, who actually played the young and innocent Sir Henry. You see him here with beard and moustache, but it's quite clearly Richard Green. Hugo, how can he fetch him? She isn't here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she isn't, eh? Come on, I'll show you. The Hound of the Baskervilles first appeared serialised in the Strand magazine in 1901. Earlier that year, Arthur Conan Doyle had been on a golfing holiday in Norfolk with his friend Fletcher Robinson. One night, over brandy nightcaps, they got talking about ghosts and spirits. And Robinson told the author some tales about spectral hounds in his neck of the woods, Devonshire. This fired Doyle's imagination, and he set to work in a novel featuring a creature like the Phantom Hound. He even visited Robertson's home on Dartmoor to research the locale. Interestingly, the coachman who drove Doyle to various locations on the moor was called Baskerville. Doyle liked the name and took it for the family haunted by the spectral beast in his novel. The more he wrote, the more he realised he needed a clever central figure to bring all the threads of the story together. A detective. Well, he had a detective, Sherlock Holmes, but unfortunately he killed him off because he'd grown tired of the character. Holmes had perished with his arch enemy, the criminal mastermind Professor James Moriarty, at the Reichenbach Falls in Switzerland. 
Doyle knew Holmes was necessary for the Phantom Hound tale, so, reluctantly, he brought him back, claiming that the Baskerville case took place before the Reichenbach Falls incident. Convenient, eh? The story emerges then as a potent concoction of the gothic and supernatural and the scientific, a rational detective investigating the unknown. Fox never attempted to present the hound as a ghostly fiend. It didn't glow in the dark or have strange markings. It was just a big dog. It was a 140-pound Great Dane called Chief in the credits. But this was not its real name. He was called Blitzen. But as the New York Times reported on the 21st of May, 1939, Hollywood's current distaste with Nazidom had made it essential to remove the jarring the Teutonic taint in the name Blitzen. Please understand my dilemma, my so responsibility. Chief I was the it was. Best friend. My duty is to protect that boy. If I should take him down there to Baskerville Hall and anything happened to him... Uh, what I'd suggest, Dr. Mortimer, is... It is interesting to note that uh, oh, in this particular you, scene you, there is a section a missing from the original script. Mind. At one point, when Dr. Mortimer arrives, Watson offers to withdraw, to leave Holmes alone with his client. But uh, Holmes asks him to stay, and Mortimer adds, please do stay, Dr. Watson. As a medical man, you'll be able to convince Mr. Holmes of my sanity, which you might well doubt when you hear my story. The whole scene was rewritten without that section. Whether it was filmed or not, I don't know. But the new section was scripted at the end of February 1939. And the film, if you remember, was released at the end of March, 1939. Well, Holmes, what do you make of it? Do you think there's anything in it? Good heavens, you're not going to start scratching on that infernal thing, are you? Dear old Watson. The violin is one of the standard Holmes props, so no self-respecting Sherlock impersonator would be without one. Actually, in Doyle's story, The Cardboard Box, Watson notes that Holmes was a capable player. Bruce's Watson seems to think otherwise. While Fox, probably unknowingly, were forging one of the most memorable screen partnerships with Rathbone and Bruce, Canada, sure neither actor received top billing. It seems strange today that a Sherlock Holmes movie should not have the actor playing Holmes at the top of the cast list. Fox, this privilege went to Richard Green. There he is, the romantic lead, playing Sir Henry Baskerville. This is the first and only time the actor playing Holmes has not received top billing. For 21-year-old Green, this was his sixth film. He had appeared in Four Men and a Prayer early in 1938 and this secured him a Hollywood contract with Fox. He'd appeared in a further four films that year before walking onto the set of The Hound. The screenplay for The Hound of the Baskervilles was written by Ernest Pascal. He's another Englishman. So many British talents were involved in this production. Pascal was born in 1896. He began his association with movies in the 20s, and several of his novels, including The Black Swan and The Savage, were adapted for the screen. Green. Pascal's first talk, he was interference yes, in 1928, for which he supplied additional dialogue. He went on to spend much of his time at 20th Century Fox, collaborating on a string of historical movies, such as Lloyds of London and Wee Wheelie Winky. So, probably, it was his track record with period dramas and his Englishness that caused him to be chosen as the writer of the screenplay for this film. This note is exactly as Doyle created it in the novel. While the screenplay wanders away from the original text from time to time, a great deal of the detail remains, although it has to be said that the message is supposed to be cut from the pages of the Henry. Times, and in fact, no, Basil Rathbone as Holmes it, asserts Holmes? that is the case. But we can see quite clearly that, that uh, this is not really cut from the top people's oh, newspaper. The words have been snipped from the London Times. That's evident from the topography. But the word moor is an unusual word. Your correspondent evidently couldn't find it in the newspaper. You'll admit, Dr. Mortimer, there's nothing supernatural about this. Supernatural? Uh, tell me, Sir Henry, has anything else unusual happened to you today since your arrival in London? I can't think of anything. In the original story, this note is a warning from Beryl Stapleton. She's concerned about 
You're Set Henry's boots, safety his brand and new ones. wants to prevent him from going from the, the wall. But in this film, Beryl Stapleton knows nothing about the threat to his life. So who has sent the note? And for what purpose? It's one of the models in the screenplay that is never explained. Now, will you please tell me what this is all about? Dr. Mortimer bringing me here to see you. This letter, it's about you, Sir Henry. Your inheritance, Baskerville Hall. And Dr. Mortimer thinks that it might not be safe for you to go down there. Safe? On account of a hound. A wild, supernatural monster that has cursed you Baskervilles for the last two or three hundred years. Ho, ho, that sounds grand. A family ghost, eh? Why didn't you tell me about this before, Dr. Mortimer? Well, uh, Mr. Holmes suggested... He's going to tell you about it now, Sir Henry. Take him back to the hotel, Dr. Mortimer. Show him that old document. Tell him everything, the whole business. I'll join you a little later. The Hollywood on, designers we'll went overboard when they came to Holmes' lodgings. About, in Conan Doyle's stories, initially, the impoverished detective could not afford to pay the rent for the rooms at 221B. He needs to share the cost. That's where Dr. Come on, Watson. Watson comes in. They are comfortable rooms at a cheap price, we, we are told. Humble and cosy to and cluttered. But Hollywood has it differently. They are palatial. Take the staircase down which Holmes and Watson race now after Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer. It would grace a mansion. It's too grand, surely, for a terrace dwelling in Baker Street. And talking of Baker Street, look at these magnificent sets of London, created by Richard Day and Hans Peters, the set designers. They're very, very convincing and must have taken up a tremendous space in the 20th Century Fox studios. Keep an eye on that handsome. It's nice also to see Holmes and Watson dressed appropriately with top hats. So often producers of the films of Sherlock Holmes always show Holmes in a deerstalker, even when he's in the city. The Victorians were very careful about their dress code. And Holmes would always wear a top hat or a bowler hat in town, and only a deerstalker in the country, as he does in this film. Unfortunately, not all filmmakers adhere to this rule. I remember Murder by Decree, starring Christopher Plummer, and he emerges from the Opera House in the middle of London, wearing a deerstalker. Whip up, Jabby! Whip up, I say! Very good, Who was it? I don't know, but it's just as I expected. Hadn't we better hurry on and, and warn them? No, 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 no. They're not in any danger. Now, here's the number of that hansom. Find out from Scotland Yard who the cabbie is, and if you can, fetch him along to the hotel. I'll do my best. It's not too long now before we get to Dartmoor with Watson. And before well, we do that, it might be useful to comment Watson on some of the changes everything. in the original script. What have you decided? To go there, of course. Good, that's what I thought you'd say. And if Dr. Mortimer will only guarantee that this uh, supernatural hound of his will really appear, I'd call the radio. Oh, don't say that, my boy. <laughs> Sounds like a bogey story they tell kids. Scenes that didn't make it into the, the final yes, print. Rather. The original it opening, which includes a scene know, between however, Mortimer and his wife. Was shadowed from but my he tells her he has just found an old document shadowed. containing the legend yes, of the Hound of the Baskerville. Been ever since you arrived in London. I found I it know. only the other day among some of Sir Charles' know. papers, he says. A man and a Mrs. Mortimer scoffs. He must have seen me run oh, that old myth the, the people therefore. around here are always talking oh, about. I? Did you ever discover your mislaid boot? No. Uh, hello. It is in this scene that Mortimer expresses his fear well, the for the safety here. of the new the heir. One, the black one's has gone. Mrs. Mortimer tells him that he should go to the police with suspicion. Or Scotland Yard. Yes, do. They'll laugh in my face, says Mortimer. Now, why should a hound of hell, a supernatural monster. A brand but it's there. Something, I swear. Um, no, no, I can't. So Mrs. Mortimer comes Come up with this advice. Well, uh, what about really, consulting yes, about that, that Mr. Bullshit. Sherlock Holmes? Oh, I it, he wouldn't laugh in your face, no matter how chair. strange it all seemed. Mortimer is impressed with the idea. Oops, His wife continues. Nothing could be stranger than that Hindu murder, department. and he solved oh, that. The, the newspapers were full of it at the time. Like no, 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 of course not. The scene ends with, as the script has it, Good Across evening, the moor Captain. comes evening, a weird Captain. low moan him. that rises him, to a hideous howl. Come this, way. this not only unnerves Mortimer, this is but also Clayton, his small spaniel, which cowers hey, at his feet. Do, won't you, won't Whether this down? scene was filmed, I don't know, but it certainly didn't make Won't it into the final print. And it may have some bearing on Mortimer's claim that he had a dog, a small spaniel, now, and he doesn't have it now. I wish you'd tell us who your fare was that watched a certain house on Baker Street this evening and later followed these two gentlemen. Well, I'm gloating you. You know as much as I do, sir. Well, not quite as much, I hope. The gent said as how he was a, a detective, sir. 
Oh, he did. Yes. The cabbie in this scene is the uh, old British actor E.E. Uh, e. Clive, who was promoted to police inspector in the second Fox film. The like Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, filmed some months beard. later. The director of this film, Sidney Landfield, had a fairly oh, undistinguished so film career. I see. He was a former uh, jazz musician, and the hand was his only foray into dramatic horror when detective he genre. Guineas, what his later me. films were comedies, uh, did he tell you his like name? The Meanest Man yes. in the World with uh, Jack Benny, 1942, Holmes. Bring on the Girls, starring what? Veronica Lake, 1945, the me, and The Lemon Drop Kid Sherlock with Bob Holmes. Hope, in 1950. <laughs> Some Holmes fans have accused Here's Landfield's me. direction as being Here's somewhat um, stodgy. Film trouble. historian William K. Everson thought that the film was a little too measured in its pacing and Nothing states all, that no, one of the film's shortcomings day, was the lack of an inspired director. Well, I would agree to some extent. I believe Lamfield does a very workmanlike job with some stylish touches, though. The low camera angles and the use of shadows is very effective. Are you planning to go down to Dartmoor? Immediately, tomorrow. I'm really awfully keen to see the old place. Uh, you'll accompany us, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I'd like to and very so, much, Dr. Mortimer. Holmes is about to entrust the future of Sir Henry in into the hands of, of Watson. No While today, Please Bruce's Watson seems facile, Rathbone never agreed with the criticism that Bruce's interpretation of Watson was weak. He was secure in his view that Bruce was a great Watson. Spurn wrote in his autobiography, There's no question in my mind that Nigel Bruce was the ideal Dr. Watson. There was an endearing quality to his performance that humor the relationship between Dr. Watson and Mr. Holmes. It has always seemed to me that our adventures may have met with less kindly public acceptance had they been recorded by a less lovable companion to Holmes than was Nigel's Dr. Watson. Keep me posted, Watson. Write me daily reports. To the smallest detail, Holmes. Fine. I give him into your care, Sir Henry. Guard him well. Good night. Certainly it was Nigel Bruce alone who ensured Dr. Watson would never appear in the cast of a movie as a mere supporting character. None of the screen Watsons up to Bruce had enjoyed the luxury of co-star status, but they did afterwards. So here is the impressive Dartmoor set. The Moreland set was an amazing construction, sprawling over an entire soundstage, strewn with boulders and skeletal trees. Smoke machines provided the rolling layers of ever-present fog. In fact, the set was so big, so the story goes, that Richard Green, wandering onto it one day, got lost. Beyond that hill, those dark spots. That's the great Grimpen Mire. Frank Nugent, writing in the New York Times, thought that the technicians had whipped up a moor at least as desolate as any ghost story moor has need to be. The mist swirls steadily, the savage howl of the Baskerville Hound is heard at all the melodramatic appropriate intervals. Strangely, this artificial environment adds to the effectiveness of the movie. Once away from the civilized, handmade London, we are in a fairy tale realm of gothic horror. The set is a surreal backdrop to these events. And let's face it, what could be more surreal than being chased over desolate moorland by a great big phantom hound? And now, if you look, Baskerville Hall, the home of your ancestors, Sir Henry. And so here we are, indeed, at Baskerville Hall. How are you, Barryman? Very well, thank you, sir. The bearded butler, Barryman, is played by John Carradine, one of the few Americans to appear in the movie. Thank you. Carradine was not too happy about playing the role of the butler. He said, They made me wear a beard to look sinister. Of course, no English butler wore a beard, but it was for the audience to say, He did it, he did it, as soon as they saw me. But I didn't. I was only the red herring. Movies sometimes use me just for that purpose. Well, what Carradine didn't say, or perhaps he didn't know, was that the butler in the novel had a beard. It was an integral part of the plot. So really, he shouldn't accuse a studio of landing with this hirsute appendage. It is interesting, too, that the name of the butler was changed from Barrymore in the novel to Barryman in the film. The reason behind this is vague, but it has been mooted that it was changed because it might cause confusion with the celebrated acting family, the Barrymores. John of that clan having played Sherlock Holmes in a film of that name in 1921. Be careful, sir. These steps are a bit in need of repair. Again, we're on track with the novel. Watson does send written reports to Holmes, 
who he thinks is still in London. It's interesting to note that while The Hound of the Baskervilles is the most famous and most popular of the Holmes stories, it is the one in which the great detective is absent for at least a third of the action. Once we move to Dartmoor, it becomes Watson's tale. Let's just have some further thoughts about the screenplay for a moment while Watson and Sir Henry do some snooping. Screenwriter Pascal keeps very close to the outline of the novel in general, although he streamlines the plot. He eliminates one of the characters altogether, Laura Lyons, who provides Holmes with final proof of the murderer's guilt. This causes there to be less mystery at the heart of the story. No doubt this was deliberate. Audiences wanted a rousing tale without too many confusing corkscrew twists of the literary source. Now those who know the novel will know that uh, we are missing Mrs Barrymore sobbing in the night also. Plus, the warning about crossing the moor when the powers of evil are exalted. Strange that that really chilling and excellent line is missing. And also Laura Lyon's association with Sir Charles and Stapleton. And also the remnants of a note found in the grate by Barrymore. It is though Pascal has swept all these convolutions and intricacies of the plot to one side to get to the basic thrilling idea that there's a man out there being threatened doing, by a phantom hound. Oh, nothing, sir. It was the window. the window. Also, we have lost the antagonism yes, Stapleton feels towards Sir Henry when he takes well, up with Barrow. In the novel, they quarrel bitterly. But well, now that in this film she is his stepsister and not his wife, there is really no well, need for such antagonism. Enough. And we're also well, led to believe that in the movie, Beryl knows absolutely nothing about the Hound or a stepbrother's machinations. Actually, in the original script, there was a brief scene where Stapleton catches Sir Henry kissing Beryl. At first, Stapleton is cross, cross rather than angry. When Sir Henry assures him that his intentions are honourable, he quickly calms down. This scene was cut. Probably because, uh, really, there was no tension in it at all. Another scene of the original script that was cut is the opening scene in Baker Street with Mrs. Hudson and Watson complaining about Holmes's playing of the violin. Apparently he has been scratching away all night. Watson says to Mrs. Hudson, couldn't you suggest to him to, in a tactful way, that he takes a few lessons? There's an Italian professor down the street but Mrs. Hudson admits she wouldn't dare. Here we are, Watson, man of action, leading Sir Henry Still out onto there. the moor. I have always felt that scriptwriters allowed Bruce's Watson to be more Try sensible when Holmes wasn't around. Perhaps his intimidating influence made him bumble more. Now, you will notice that while we're in a very dramatic situation, out on the moor at night, the mist is all around, danger lurks behind every boulder, and yet there is no dramatic music. All is silent. One of the great puzzles concerning this film is the lack of music, especially at exciting moments. Suitable music could have heightened the drama and added a few frissons. Obviously, Fox learned their lesson for the next film, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, which was made only a few months later, when they had a full-blown score. Interestingly, they used the same composer as that of The Hound, Cyril J. Mockridge, another British talent who went to work on several notable movies. My Darling Clementine, 1946, How to Marry a Millionaire, in 1953, and the 1960 Elvis Presley movie, Flaming Star. Guess you can't get more far removed from Victorian sleuth to a rock and roll idol such as a diversity of cinema. Whoever it is may now, come back. The Hound of the Baskervilles has music in the early stages, but once we get to Dartmoor and all the scenes that ask for music to heighten the brooding menace and the drama, there's silence. Again, one wonders if the speed with which this film was put together, the cutting of the scenes, etc., didn't allow the composer time to create a full score. Or perhaps the director believed that silence meant a quiet menace to events. 
I think it's probably a project for some mad? enterprising composer to create a new and Whoever full blooded score among these rocks, we don't. for the hound. Who the devil can it be? You were right about Barrowman. Yes, but what connection can there possibly be between that horrible creature and Barrowman? You know, I've half a mind to fire the fellow in the morning. In this scene, the police, and let we see Nigel Bruce as close to Doyle's to do. Watson as Our I think we ever see him. Barrowman. He's sensible him like and careful hawk. and intelligent. Come on. Let's get back. What do you think it is? What does it sound like to, to you? Well, if we were back in London, this would seem ridiculous. Let's get on. Look here, Doctor. You don't believe that nonsense, do you? Of course not. No more than you know. Watson's notes are always sensible, too, in his letters to Holmes, as though he's really being useful to the detective. Morning. Morning, Sir Henry. So that's our famous Moore, eh? There yes, we have sir. English actress Eile Malion as Mrs Barrymore. Strange, angular features. She doesn't do much, but she constantly wears the haunted expression, quite rightly so, because she knows her brother, the convict, is out there on the moor. Come in. Oh, where's Sir Henry? He went out, sir. Where? Across the moor. Didn't I tell you to let me know immediately? If Sir Henry ever ventured out there alone? I know, but I only just found out from my wife. Still behaving in his red herring fashion. In the original novel, there are too few suspects, and Pascal tries in his screenplay to create quite a few people who might possibly be behind the hound. And now, we're about to meet the real villain of the piece. Well, the real villain, of course, is the that. Hound of the Baskervilles. But the Hound has to have well, a keeper, at you, Dr. and this is Stapleton, my name's Stapleton the mastermind the behind the plot How to kill you know Sir Henry, oh, from Dr. who Sherlock Holmes is after. Oh, yes, Hi, Sir Henry. Even in the novel, well, Stapleton is well, we were a bit rather an insipid character. I suppose this is done so we don't suspect him. Mr. In the movie, he's company. equally insipid in the hands of Morton Lowry, oh, another British actor. I haven't the slightest idea. He had well, a short career in help, Hollywood and was last seen in a small part well. in the Picture Thank of you, Dorian Gray, I don't think I 1945. Be Wonderful place this However, that same year, he also appeared in one of the like Universal it. Holmes movies, Pursuit to Gosh, Algiers, Baron, in a bit part. You see those bright green he seemed to disappear after that film. It is a mystery what happened to him. That's the great Grimpen Mar. One false step means death. In this movie, Stapleton's motives for wanting to kill Sir Henry are dealt with very briefly and in a perfunctory manner in the closing minutes of the movie. It is though his motive doesn't really matter much. What's that? To be fair, it is a motive that doesn't hold much water. Surely you don't believe such If he is prepared to shoot Sir Henry, as he was in London from the handsome cab, or poison him as he does towards the end of the book, why bother with the hound in the first place? If anything is extinct on the moor. That was a voice, a woman's voice. And so the lovers meet. Thank heavens you heard me. Another few yards you'd have been into that mire. Looks innocent, doesn't it? This is Wendy Only Barry, who received third billing it. above Nigel Bruce. Wendy Barry is well, Beryl Stapleton. In the novel, she is the ill-used wife yes. of Jack Stapleton, the naturalist. But in this movie, she him. becomes his stepsister, oh, thus removing her far from any the blood connection with the villain. Coupled with the fact that in oh, the movie, she has no notion no? of Stapleton's diabolical plans, this allows the romance between her and Sir Henry to be acceptable to the audiences of the time. But you do now. 
Wendy Barry's godfather was J.M. Barry, who created the name Wendy and wrote her into his famous children's fantasy, Peter Pan. After this movie, Wendy Barry's Hollywood career dwindled. In 1948, she had her own TV show and was later active in local radio and then faded away. I was just telling Dr. Watson how delighted we are you decided to come here. I'm here and to stay. It is strange that both she and her stepbrother have very clear-cut British accents. It's never clear what they're doing on Dartmoor, but again, as we shall see, they are not dwelling in simple circumstances like the equivalent characters in the book. Of course, you already know Dr. Mortimer. The only other one's old Mr. Franklin. Who's he? Oh, wait till you meet him, Sir Henry. He'll bring suit against you, I warn you. What on earth for? Oh, you'll find something. Suing people is a passion with him. I'll look forward to meeting him. All right, tomorrow night, then. Thank you. And thank you again for rescuing me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Another intelligent notice from Dr. Watson. He's very astute. There's something about this fellow Stapleton I don't like. Quite right too, Watson. As with Baker Street, the Stapleton's home, Merry Pitt House, the humble little farmstead of the novel, is converted by Hollywood into a grand affair, oh, almost rivaling Baskerville Hall for its opulence. I'm not in the habit of Later we will glimpse the, the fine staircase. It seems very strange in a way that the Stapletons appear to be quite wealthy to live in such opulent surroundings. What? Why does Stapleton want to kill Sir Henry for money when he has such a nice home of his own? That's a very serious charge. But we shouldn't always press for logic too much in movies like this. It's a pity I didn't have time earlier to talk about Mrs. Hudson. It was only glimpsed in the very early scene in Baker Street. An excellent vintage it is Mary too. Gordon plays but Mrs. Hudson. That I'm tipsy, it's a minor oh, role, but she not. became Never indelibly the writing. kindly housekeeper at 221B. To As you can sir, observe, she Mr. was a tiny Stapleton Scottish actress who never really lost her accent, despite being in Hollywood for many, many years. When Rathbone and Bruce began appearing on radios, Holmes and Watson, she went with them as Mrs. Hudson. And similarly, when Universal began its series of Holmes movies in 1942, Mary Gordon was part of the team with Rathbone and Bruce. And according to British law, that constitutes body snatching. Deny that if you can. But what good will it do you to prosecute Mr. Stapleton? None, sir. I have no interest in the matter. I act entirely from a sense of public duty. If you care to drop by my house someday and take a tipple of wine with me, I'd be glad to tell you a thing or two about everybody here. About him prowling the Grimpen Mire at nights and why he takes her with him. There is a new major scene in oh, the film. No secret about us. As you could hear, as you know, Mortimer says we dabble in the occult. And this is leading up to a seance session. She finds the old cable which is completely fresh in the invention of Pascal, phenomena. the screenwriter. Have you ever tried to communicate with my uncle since his death? Oh, yes, on several occasions, but with no success. But if my wife could send to a seance tonight while you, Sir Henry, are present, we might... No, no, James, not tonight. Just before Please. the seance takes place, <laughs> Stapleton shows Watson and Sir Henry's collection room? of skulls. In the novel, Stapleton collects butterflies and moths, but this change of detail is rather effective, evolving as it does the passion of the merger for bones and dead things. It's a, an adaptation and change that's picked up by many other productions, forgetting the butterfly element and having Stapleton interested in dead things. You'll observe its unusual cranial index. My wife has consented. She's agreed to a seance. Splendid. Oh, fine. Please come at once. It is Mortimer's now, wife. If you'll all get chairs and arrange a yourselves naturally comfortably here with the fire, played by another British actress, Beryl Mercer, can call who conducts the, the seance. Deep. But will they answer? They'll not answer scoffers or skeptics. If that's your attitude, Mr. Franklin, perhaps you wouldn't mind leaving us. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Franklin didn't mean to doubt. Of course I doubt. And I ask you to keep a civil tongue in your head, Dr. Mortimer. Ordering As a sequence, from under the, roof the seance works very well indeed, very and one that strengthens a sense of the supernatural oh, now, Franklin, invading this me. desolate region. Now, tonight we may communicate with Sir Charles, find out what he feared so greatly. It is one of the great strengths of from. the book, 
and often Again, film adaptations uh, fail to create and sustain the mood of unknown uh, menace. Uh, would you please put out those lights? Certainly. It is interesting to note that the recent BBC version Stable. in 2002 light, also included a seance awesome. scene in their production, but it failed to work on the same level as this. Now, if you all keep quiet, and sit quite naturally. It has been suggested that the seance was included because of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's interest in the subject and involvement with spiritualism. But I think this is unlikely. Sir Charles, it's just an exciting addition to the plot. Let us know if and it needed present. it from a time point of there view. That only because without it, the running time of this movie Speak would have been reduced to about an hour. Much too short there for a major movie. Even as it is, close. at 80 minutes, it's quite short. Big pictures, as they were called in the 30s, had a running time on average of 90 minutes. Let us know if you're present. There are things that only you can tell us. Speak to us, Sir Charles, if you're here. In the original script, the seance had more action. Can explain. When Mrs. Mortimer is calling out for the spirit of That's Sir Charles Baskerville, I've heard it before. we see it's the nothing. escaped convict, Selden. The wind. Outside the room, he's raising the sash window. Or a bitter. And then I was telling he throws Dr. a Watson knife into the room. About it. it lands in the back of Sir Henry's chair. This Sir was Charles? cut, and I think that's a good thing too. This real element would have robbed this scene of its supernatural tingle. What happened that night? The reason the scene was what cut is probably feared? based on a more practical reason than Tell that, us, though, Charles, because the actor playing the Selden weird, um, had to drop out of the film more. halfway through filming, and so a new actor had to be brought Listen. in, and many of his there scenes had again. to be reshot. Well, I can't stand I it. Think Will it somebody would have been difficult lights, to get all the actors together nothing. for this scene nothing just to film his, and so. That particular element ended up on the cutting room floor. Mr. Franklin, what did you think it was? The Hound, of course. The Hound of the Baskervilles. Any fool would know that. James, get my cape. Take me home. There you are, my dear. It is interesting that uh, s some of the legacies that this film give you have and brought to Henry other versions no, of this you. particular story. There is no Mrs. Mortimer in You're the truly. original novel. But we... nearly every production following before. this one Often. writes like the character in. And as already so mentioned, the seance is featured now in two you. movies. It doesn't matter what they are or where they come from. Oh, you don't know. Oh, you've got to get all that nonsense out of your head, Beryl. I wish I could. You're going to. I'm going to make it my business to see that you do. You've been alone too much. There's nothing to do down here. That's the trouble. I'm going to change all that, if you let me. We'll go fishing together, riding. You like riding? Yes, I do. Good. We'll start tomorrow, shall we? Yes, thanks. Fine. I'll ride over for you in the morning. Are you coming, Sir Henry? Right, Doctor. Good night. Good night. Here we see Watson being very astute again in his message to Holmes. Although this scene supposedly is supposed to be the next day Hello. after the Hello, seance, Bill. the well, conversation suggests that they've There's been meeting we been. on many occasions for rides and, and social are. events. You know, Jack says that they're over 50,000 years Building old. up the sense of romance is really growing into something very serious. All right, good. Again, we cannot fail to be impressed by this set. Those flattish stones over there, they're graves. Oh, and those huge ones, monoliths, the remains of their temples. Doesn't anybody know who they were or what they looked like? <laughs> Jack has some theory about them. But anyway, they must have been very primitive, living on roots and dressing in skins. <laughs> but still laughing and dreaming, just as we do. <laughs> as romantic seduction scenes go, this is quite sweet. His bride into this very and you do feel sympathy and so an affection for darling, these young lovers. <laughs> You know, this is probably where she cooked his first meal for him. <laughs> what a yell he must have let out when she burnt it up. <laughs> and now they're quite forgotten. Just as we will be, too, one day. Do you suppose when a man met a girl that he liked, that he had to wait a respectably long time before he dared tell her? Or things like that. Sudden. Natural. I'd like to think that things were like that. Beryl... That's the way they are with me. 
Oh. Oh, but we've, we've only known each other such a little while. Yeah, you see, convention, custom. We can't even be ourselves when we want to be. Why is that? It will be you know, remembered, of course, that Richard Green went on to great television fame Jack and I first came in to the 50s by appearing as Robin Hood then. in the television now, series. Oh. Numerous episodes. When I'm with you, it's gone. I seem to forget it, laughing and talking. But when I'm alone, it all comes back to me. And at night, I, I still wake up trembling, as if in my sleep I could hear those awful noises. Then it gets bad as ever, and I... Oh, I think of you, and I wish you weren't here. Oh, don't say that. Well, I wish you were in London or, or in Canada. But even if I wanted to go back to London or Canada, I couldn't. Why not? Well, you know why. You must know why. I can't go anywhere now, unless you come with me. Oh, Henry. Perfect timing from Nigel Bruce. Starting to uh, bluster a little because Holmes is in the vicinity. Would you mind uh, Adapters of this story are I'm always frustrated that their star, oh, hello, the Sir actor Henry playing Holmes, just... is absent from we the were, action for we so were, long. We were getting engaged. And they carry out engaged. various ploys Splendid. to bring him back May into I the action. You both? Thank you. Thank you. Here's Ernest Pascal's solution. Holmes in disguise as a peddler. Who is that? It seems that we didn't pick a very secluded spot. What do you want? Just crossing the moor, sir. Just crossing the moor. It I'd is a very a, good disguise. I'd be peddling my wares, sir. And Rathbone I'd, carries I'd it off with a plum. Would interest you, sir. But really, who Tell else could this nice odd character organ, be sir. but Sherlock Holmes? The audience know who it no, is. thank you. <laughs> they need to know who it is <laughs> to assure them that Holmes like is still on you, the sir. case a and a in the vicinity. A fussel for calling your sheep dog. So he fools everyone. Particularly Watson, charmer, except the audience. Also, it's great fun to see Rathbone turn the turbos on Bruce and play for laughs for a change. Of course, the home stories abound with examples of Holmes disguises, from sea captains to old ladies. So this innovation is still in keeping with the character. I ain't doing no harm. You know, that's what I hate about this moor. There's always something strange. Look, he's limping on the other foot now. Is that Holmes really having a joke, or is Watson incorrect? This note is a late addition to the film. In the novel, it is Franklin who informs Watson that he's seen a man camping on the moors. Batman. This leads Watson to investigate, and, yes, and he discovers Holmes' hideout. Who delivered this This note? element of the story was included in no the one, original sir. script, it but it was cut. Door. And the simpler version of Holmes sending Watson a, an anonymous note Thank to you. meet him at the hut in, has been inserted. Why these cuts were made is difficult to say. It was probably more a case of time rather than money. Fox needed to have the film finished quickly. They were shooting rewrites as late as February, only a month before the film was released. Uh, is the Henry at home? No, sir. He's gone across this the is the mystery at the heart oh, of the sorry, movie. Sorry, I missed him. The Fox was used to turning out no, films sir. rapidly. Oh, well, thank you, Ben. But all Hollywood I'll studios did at the time. Call, yes, do. Perhaps this was taking too long, and they had to make cuts both in scenes and other things like the music. There were complications when Seldom, for some reason, couldn't play the part all the way through the film, and its scenes had to be reshot. But at 80 minutes, it is a very short movie. The first indication that Jack Stapleton is not all that he seems. The discovery of Holmes's hideout is exactly as it is in the book apart from the fact that Holmes is not in disguise when Watson re-encounters him. Mm. 
looking at this, you can clearly see Bruce's darkened moustache and darkened hair. What in the novel is a simple reunion between Detective and his friend turns out to be a minor little comic scene where Rathbone continually pretends to be the peddler while Bruce grows more and more irate. Was it you who sent me that communication? I did, sir. Out with it. Whatever it is you want me to hear. I, I only want you to hear this zither, sir. Zither? They don't come no finer, sir. What blasted impertinence. Getting me out here to sell. Look here, my man. You're up to something. I, I only ask you to try him, sir. Be careful. This thing's loaded. Who are you? As intimated earlier, well, as soon as Holmes returns on the you, scene, sir. Watson Trailing starts to lose his newfound common sense and maturity. Everybody. That's my business. To it also leads Bruce to oh, overact a little in this scene. It? Yes, and if you want to know who I am, I'll tell you. Who are ye? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, the detective? Yes, yeah, so and now perhaps you realize why I can't be hoodwinked. Oh, sir, 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 that changes everything. Now, who are you? Quick! Well, in that case, sir, my name must be Watson. <laughs> Holmes! How are you, my dear fellow? A fine detective you are, calling yourself Sherlock Holmes. So you've been down here on the moor all the time. That's As a stage actor, Rathbone was very practiced at makeup, and it's always London. wonderful to see him actually removing the makeup so very, very quickly from his disguises. Yeah, reports, dear, Within moments, he is the familiar, lean-faced detective again. A shabby trick, which I'll not forget. Ah, but a very necessary trick. If I'd come down here with you and Sir Henry, every movement of mine would have been watched. While in this way, only you and Sir Henry have been watched, and I've been free to work. That's all very well. But making a fool of me. Sit down, Watson. Do sit down. Perhaps a little supper will help you to get over your huff. Huff? I'm in no huff. Yeah, try some of these sardines. It's a pity I didn't know you were coming. I'd have provided a brace of pheasants. It's a pity you didn't think of bringing down that infernal violin of yours to regale me with some of your enchanting music. I did, my dear Watson. Anything to oblige. The reference to the violin again would have probably well, had more have impact if the scene finish, concerning Mrs. Hudson and along. Watson complaining well. about it uh, earlier in the film, I'm which had been cut, had not been cut. There are still some gaps to be filled in, but all in all, things are becoming a little clearer. Not to me, I assure you. Still a hopeless jumble. Mr. Franklin, Dr. Mortimer, the Barrowmans, put it all together and what have you got? So now we have Holmes in classic Murder, garb. my dear Watson. The deer stalker, the fore and aft cap, and the pea jacket. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Or perhaps I should say in my imagination, for that's where crimes are conceived and where they're solved. In the imagination. This speech about no imagination and crime is original to the film. Pascal nicely pastiches Conan Doyle in our sentiments. That's why so many murders remain unsolved, Watson. People will stick to facts, even though they prove nothing. Now, if we go beyond facts, use our imagination as the criminal does. Imagine what might have happened and act upon it. As I've been trying to do in this case, we usually find ourselves justified. Then you know? Another day, two at the most, and I will know. My one fear is that the murderer will strike before we're ready. In that case... What's that? Where's it coming from? There. No, 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 there. One wonders why Holmes does not know. In the novel, Holmes is Down. perfectly aware who the murderer on, is at this particular quick. juncture. One of the penalties of using a sound stage rather than real exteriors is it does tend to echo a little bit, like an interior sound stage. Look! Sir Henry! 
Rathbone does look brilliant in the deer stalker, and it's not given to all actors who play Holmes to wear a deer stalker with such a plum. Jeremy Brett looked very good in a deer stalker too, but he hated having to wear one. The convict! Thank heaven! What? That's the man I shot at the night we arrived. The man Batterman was signalling to. Who is it? The Notting Hill murderer. He escaped from prison last month. Been hiding on the moor ever since. The Notting Hill murderer? Do you mean that he is responsible for all this? That remains to be seen. But he's wearing Sir Henry's clothes. Yes, yes, that accounts for it. Accounts for what? For the hound. These clothes were the cause of that poor devil's death. Do you mean that the hound was after Sir Henry? Yes, and mistook the convict for him because of the scent of the clothes. Rathbone was perhaps never better as Holmes in Why this film. Why do you film? suppose the brown one? He the said one of making worn, the movie, was so mysteriously replaced of the all the adventures, why? The Hound is my favourite, and it was in this owner. picture and the black that, one that, one that I had this stimulating experience come to be of creating Sir within my own limited framework enough. a character who has intrigued me why, as Dr. much Watson? as any uh, I have played. Somebody hurt? Who's this? The convict who escaped from Princeton. Oh, how terrible. Graham Greene, the famous novelist, worked as a film critic in the 30s. You know, and he wrote of Rathbone's performance oh, as that dark knife-blade face and snapping My mouth, an eager face, you came in time wearing to an expression tragedy. of high-strung yes. energy. It's most unpleasant remembrance for me to take back to London tomorrow. Oh, must you go so soon? I've been looking forward to meeting you. Yes, yes, I'm afraid I must. Well, we were hoping, Mr. Holmes, that you may be able to shed some light on the occurrences that have puzzled us down here. Let's take a moment to see how Rathbone got here in yes, the first place. Yes, but an place. investigator needs something more than legends and rumours. During the 30s, oh, quite so. Basil Rathbone had appeared hand, in supporting Watson? roles in many of the great films of the, of the period, oh, let me give usually playing right, the villain. We can all right, thank you. For example, he was Mr. Murdstone in David Copperfield, Evremond in The Tale of Two Cities, the villainous pirate Levasseur in Captain Blood, Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet, sir. and of course, Sir Guy of Gisborne in The Adventures of Robin way, Hood. Sherlock Holmes? It's strange yes. that a man who is so yes, polished Thank at you. being a villain should emerge as the greatest detective on screen. Rathbone was born in Johannesburg in South Africa in 1892, oh, but he was educated in England. So well, Sir Henry. At Why Repton didn't you College. tell me Mr. Holmes was coming? Well, I'm he made a stage he debut in Frank Benson's touring company in 1911, it, playing Hortensio oh, well, in Taming of the Shrew. Don't mind, Sir Henry. Of course not. His acting career was interrupted in, by the Baron. First World War. He became an officer in the Liverpool I, uh, Scottish I Regiment and was sir, awarded Professor the Military Stan. Cross for bravery. I'm afraid I have some rather bad news for you. What is it? Well, it's going to be a bit of a shock. Oh. They've caught him. Your... Your brother... They'll hang him for sure. No, Mrs. Barrowman. He's beyond the law now. He's in more merciful hands. <laughs> we came upon the poor fellow as we were crossing the moor. He must have missed his footing and fallen over the cliff. No further need, Batterman, to signal to him from the window or take food out to him or give him Sir Henry's discarded clothes. Go, oh, Sir Henry. It was all my doing. Batterman here wanted to tell you all along so as you could notify the police. The script was never kin, really clearly kin. explains the connection Even between this lady and the good. convict. We have really to make lots of deductions ourselves. He won't hold it again. again, I think it's a, a thread that's been <laughs> lost not. somewhat in the cutting of the original screenplay. Right. Thank you, sir. Mm. Thank you, sir. Well, it's nice to get that end cleared up for their sake as well as mine. It clears up everything, I think, Sir Henry. That poor devil must have been completely demented. And that accounts for those dreadful noises that we've been hearing from time to time. Exactly. Your troubles are over, Sir Henry. <clears throat> I really am most grateful, Mr. Holmes. Oh, not at all. I've done little enough. But you can sleep peacefully in your bed now and commence to lead the life of a happy country squire. Well, not for a little bit, I'm afraid. I'm off to Canada again. Canada? Beryl, Miss Stapleton and I are going to be married. So the whirlwind romance has worked. Very charming and it can lady. be legitimate, as I mentioned Everything earlier, because... Hate. Beryl Stapleton has no night. knowledge of her brother's we'll nasty ways and, and is not directly related to him. My congratulations to Sir Henry. Thanks. 
What luck you're here. You and Dr. Watson will be with us tomorrow night. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm afraid I can't. I must hurry back to London. And so should you too, Watson. We'll have to report to the police here about that convict in the morning, but there's a train leaving early in the afternoon. Oh, what a pity. Beryl will be dreadfully disappointed. Now, we'll remedy that when you come up to London. You must... You must dine with us before you sail. Here's another sleight of hand. Remember earlier we said that Richard Green had actually well, played Hugo himself, Baskerville, Hugo. the villain Hugo of the, the family the at the beginning of the film. Here's a portrait of that very same man, painters. but oh, now he resembles I can't quite agree Stapleton. With you, Henry. One day it might prove to be of the greatest value. Well, we must be going. The next scene is interesting so because what they've theory, done almost uh, by accident, I think, they've Surely replicated a famous Sidney Paget drawing from one of the Sherlock Holmes stories in the Strand magazine. The scene on the train with Holmes and a dear stalker and Watson in a hat. In the Paget, it's a bowler hat, but apart from anything else, it replicates the Paget drawing beautifully. And why are we rushing up to London, leaving Sir Henry entirely unprotected? We're not, my dear Watson. We're just giving the impression of rushing up to London. In a minute and a half, we'll be in Oakhampton. There, we'll catch a train back to Dartmoor. If my surmise is correct, we'll nab our man in the act. But if you know who it is, why all this round about rigmarole? Why don't you have him arrested? Because I've no case. Not a shred of evidence that would hold in any court. The only way is to catch him red-handed. To catch him in such a way that there's no escape. No alibi. That the scenery in the background doesn't but you really can't resemble to save Devonshire. His life. More like but American Midwest. Otherwise, the shadow of sudden death will be forever hanging over his head, and sooner or later... Here we are, O'Campton. And may you both spend the rest of your years together in happy contentment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now, I want to thank you all for the kindness that you've shown a stranger. And when Beryl and I return, I want you to know that you'll always be welcome at Baskerville Hall. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sir Henry. It's going to be lonely for you, Mr. Stapleton, with Beryl gone. The yes, film was one of the biggest grosses for 20th Century Fox in 1939. You, and possibly this is one of the reasons why they rushed it out in my opinion, to see how the audience would react to it. The they were delighted with the response. And within months, to do uh, <laughs> oh, the Frank, next Sherlock Holmes film was being filmed, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Sadly, say, The Adventures was the last that Fox did. The best can, as sir. Britain was approaching war and America as their allies, they felt that perhaps they shouldn't spend too much money on expensive and lavish productions like this and concentrate on quicker, easier pictures to film. How far is it to Baskerville Hall? It's five miles by road, sir, but if you want to cut over the moor, it's only about three. Here you are. Come on, Watson, quick. Thank you, sir. It's amusing to note how the motion picture herald evening, saw the film's well, selling points. It stated, the obvious Eight exploitation cue right is for a strong campaign addressed to the millions to who have read the book and such something others who have not got round to reading new. it, but have meant you to know. for some time oh, that's so sweet and now under the circumstances so needn't. And come back to us soon, both of you. We will. May I offer you a lift, my lad? It's such a beautiful night, Mr. Franklin. I think I'll walk, thank you. Merely a gesture of hospitality. Reject it if you like. <laughs> Get up there. All through the film. Richard Green, as Sir Henry, has showed no the fear alone, of the moor, Why not? which is not usually the trait of Sir Henry in the other versions and sure. indeed in the book. Oh, but I have Mr. Sherlock Holmes' own word for it. Come along, James. Good night, Sir Henry. Good night, Mrs. Mortimer. And the best of luck to you both. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. I wish you'd let Mr. Franklin drive you home. I wanted to stay and say good night to you. This is our last good night. From tomorrow on, there won't be any more, ever. Tomorrow we'll be away from this place. The tension is building now. This little romantic so interlude I. is delaying what we know oh, is coming. No, don't be Hound is going to be released. The exciting point of the book. Good night, Beryl. Good night, dear. It's as though 
Beryl Seppelin has premonitions, but nothing is stated openly well, about her nice suspicions or fears about her brother's you... motives. Jack, I haven't said very much about going away, but you know how I feel. Yes, of course. It had to be. Well, you won't be too dreadfully lonely, will you? Well, I shall have my work. And... Oh, Henry and I'll be back before you even know it. Yes, of course you will. Well, you better go to bed now. You've got a big day ahead of you tomorrow. Good night, Jack. Good night, dear. There is the missing boot, taken from the Northumberland Hotel, ready for scent for the hound. Again, it's obvious that the scenes here would have been greatly enhanced by music to build up the tension and suspense. Good old Blitzen, or oh, sorry, Chief. As I already mentioned, he is not adorned with any supernatural trappings. No spectral phosphorus to make it glow in the dark, as is portrayed in the book. The 1922 silent version with Eileen Orwood as Holmes had a glowing hound. This was done by scratching the original negative around the outline of the dog, a painstaking process. Fox didn't bother. Perhaps it's as well. I think it would be difficult to realise the creature as described by Doyle. No one has done it yet. This is how Conan Doyle described the hound. Jack! A hound it was. An enormous coal black hound. Where are you? But not such a hound as mortal eye ever rested upon. Fire burst from its open mouth. Its eyes glowed with a smouldering glare. Its muzzle and heckles and dewlap were outlined in flickering flame. Never, in the delirious dream of a disordered brain, could anything more appalling, more hellish, be conceived than that dark form and savage face which broke out upon us, out of the wall of fog. Well, here we have a big dog, and nothing could match that description, I suppose. And of all the versions of the hound, no one has quite got the hound correctly. Perhaps the most laughable version was the Hammer film version. At one point they had Holmes and Watson, played by children, uh, dressed up as Holmes and Watson, and a big dog attacking them. And it looked like a big dog attacking two children. purpose of the hound really was to suggest that it was a sort of reincarnation of the, the hound that killed Sir Hugo. But here we can only just think it is a nasty big brute.
Apparently easily dealt with too. Stapleton is desperate at this moment in time, but we never really get a sense of why he's doing all this. He's and it's one of the great weaknesses of the film. You'll be all right, old man. What? Yes, old chap. Mr. Holmes? Yes. What, what, what was it? We've got to get him home quickly. Can you manage him alone? Yes. Because I've got things to do. Help get his arm around my shoulder. I'm all right. <coughs> Such was the magnetic playing of Rathbone as Holmes that he certainly secured top billing in the following film, The Adventures. And in fact, in playing Sherlock Holmes in this film, he sealed his fate. He was never able to really escape from the character of Sherlock Holmes for the rest of his life. As already mentioned, after the Hound came the adventures. And during that year, they started, Bruce and Rathbone, appearing on radio, up to 25 weeks a year, playing Holmes and Watson. And while Fox failed to continue the series, in 1942, Universal took up the challenge and decided to do a series of Sherlock Holmes films in a modern setting. He made 12 in all, up to 1946. It was at that time, when probably Rathbone was Sherlocked out, doing over 300 radio broadcasts and 12 films, he decided that he'd had enough of the character of Sherlock Holmes. People greeted him down the street saying hiya Sherlock rather than hiya Basil or hello Basil. And so he wanted to escape really not just from the character but from Hollywood for a time. And he went to New York to appear on the stage there for some time. But the shadow, the famous silhouette of Sherlock Holmes was never to leave him. He had to accept that it was part of his life now. He burlesqued the character in a comedy sketch in the late 40s on the... On, on the television and also in early 1952 he appeared as Sherlock Holmes in a 30 minute adaptation of one of Adrian Conan Doyle's stories Adrian Conan Doyle was Arthur Conan Doyle's son interestingly the review for that particular broadcast on television um, stated that Rathbone looked ill at ease with the character it's probably he was ill at ease at doing live television rather than the character of Sherlock Holmes. But that half an hour episode which might have led to a series didn't. Similarly, in 1953, he appeared on Broadway in a play called, naturally enough, Sherlock Holmes. It was written by his wife, Guido Rathbone. It won't take much longer. Now, it was a concoction of various Sherlock Holmes stories finishing in Switzerland with the Reichenbach Falls. Thank heavens you're safe. Nigel Bruce right. was too ill. Well, now Play we know for certain Dr. Watson this is no in that particular no myth, project. There really is a harm. So an actor was called Thomas Gomez yes, played me. Watson. I ran into Interestingly, Gomez was the villain he in the first Universal Watson. series, the Sherlock Holmes and the Voice of Terror. The play so the ran for three performances only on Broadway I must finish before first. closing. This in the late 50s, Rathbone recorded some of the Doyle stories on record for Cademan Records. I'm a bit of a doctor myself, you know. Do you think and you then in the mid-60s, sure shortly before his death, I think you really ought to go, Dr. he was thinking about coming back to the character urgent. of Sherlock Holmes on uh, radio to do some broadcast, probably in Britain. Sadly, he didn't I, live long uh, enough I to fulfil that water, idea. Madam. He died oh, in 1967. Yes, Even today, after all the number of people who've played Sherlock Holmes, it must have Peter been a Cushing, the Jeremy Bratz, the Christopher Plummers... It was... Basil Rathbone still remains yes, I can see you're still weak from the one that everyone thinks of when you mention the name Sherlock well. Holmes on screen. Here, drink this, Sir Henry. You'll feel much stronger. I'll he see was here, Stapleton, after. trying to poison now, Sir Henry. Oh, it may Somewhat taste of an anticlimax. Sir Henry! 
In most versions of the Hound, as in the book, Stapleton attempts to cross the Grimpen Mire to escape capture and falls into the mire, falls into the boggy grasp and sinks down beneath those foul waters. Not here. This is the only version of the Hound in which we don't see the death of Stapleton. Sir Henry's lost considerable blood. Yes? Henry! Henry! I'm all right, darling. Oh, no, you're not. We heard those dreadful noises on the way home. It's a mercy he's alive. I owe you an apology, Sir Henry, for jeopardizing your life. Jeopardizing? But you saved my life. But there was no possible way for me to foretell the farm. And I must apologize, too, for deceiving you last night. When I told you that your troubles were over, I knew that they weren't. But if I hadn't cleared out, the crisis which came tonight would have been indefinitely postponed with the shadow of death hanging over you. And over you, too, Miss Stapleton. You knew this was going to happen? How could you know? The person who wanted to snuff out your life, Sir Henry, was the same one who plotted to kill your uncle. He wanted to get you both out of the way so that he could lay claim to this place, to the whole Baskerville estate. In tracing back his lineage, he discovered not only that he was the next of kin, but also learned of that old legend about the hound. So he brought the hound to life. The That's the explanation the most savage dog uh, how that Holmes find, gets to know all that information. Um, we're not told. If he had succeeded tonight, the blame would have fallen on the legendary monster. And no possible suspicion would have been attached to him. A most ingenious device. And I'm quite sure that he would have had no difficulty in proving his claim to Baskerville Hall and all that goes with it. The most amazing instance of a throwback that I've ever seen. And you can see for yourself. Stapleton! One move and I'll shoot! Jack! Don't you stay where you are! You're under arrest, Stapleton. For the murder of Sir Charles Baskerville, the murder of a convict, and the attempted murder of Sir Henry. You can't arrest me, Holmes. And this is the last we see of Stapleton. Of you bumping into the and come. knocking it down in a comic moment. Apparently, he will be arrested by one of the constables. Holmes has arranged to watch the roads, but we never shown it. Possibly we'll cross Grimpen Mire. What's the matter, old man? What's but the matter? He's usually good for him to man. see the uh, the villain caught. Stapleton, the murderer? He won't get very far. I've posted constables on both the roads, and the only other way is across the Grimpen Mire. And so we come to the conclusion. Two main features now. We get a wonderful speech from Lionel Atwell, Dr. Mortimer, to say how wonderful Holmes is. And I'm then so the sorry, controversial Stephen. last line. I wish I could have spared you this. Well, that officially closes the case, Sir Henry. And a very interesting case for your annals, Watson. An ordinary dog, an ingenious criminal. And a more ingenious detective. I owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude. Oh, we all do, Sir Henry. Mr. Holmes, we've admired you in the past, as does every Englishman. Your record as our greatest detective is known throughout the world. But this, seeing how you work, knowing that there is in England such a man as you, gives us all a sense of safety and security. God bless you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Mortimer. Thank you. And now, if you don't mind, I've had rather a strenuous day. I, I think I'll turn in. Of course. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mr. Holmes. Good night. Oh, Watson, the needle. Watson, the needle? I don't think he's going to be doing knitting. He's referring, of course, to the hypodermic needle. And that line was bleeped out of British releases well until the, uh, the early 60s, as seen as too controversial to be allowed. The 1939 version of The Hound of the Baskervilles has just been voted by the Internet Movie Database as the best version of this particular home story. And I think probably it is. Thank you for listening. Well, I warned you, now you're hooked, right? You're going to want to see everything that Basil Rathbone's ever done. I mean, you can't, uh, Nigel Bruce is Dr. Watson, come on. The, it just doesn't get any better than this fabulous com combination of some fabulous acting and Sherlock Holmes, the best of. Until the next time I see all of you, I wish you all the entertainment in the world, and ba dee ba dee ba, that's all, folks.
and that's all, folks.